So welcome everyone to the show. I have JT Tran on, JT Tran of the ABCs of Attraction, also known to some people as the Asian Playboy. And uh, JT, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you on. You're coming uh, straight up Los Angeles. And as we were just talking about, it's kind of like a mecca, mecca of pickup. Uh, why is yeah. that? Is it just because it's a big city, lots of sun, everyone's dressed down? Well, it's Los Angeles. It's a tier one city. You have beautiful women everywhere. The weather is great. It's also the um, you know the origin of Project Hollywood from uh, the game by Neil Strauss, uh, because I used to go up there all the time to to test out my skill when I was a complete noob out in like the Standard and Saddle Ranch. So people just come here um, you, from all over the world, from New York or overseas, to learn pickup. And actually, yeah, you mentioned a little bit of your background uh, there going to that the Project Hollywood. Um, and actually, for the audience of, who does, isn't aware of you, um, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Like, how do you get into this whole thing in the first place? And especially with your focus on the Asian community. Well, I started originally in January of 2004. Uh, I had basically given up on dating at that point. No matter what I did, I couldn't get a date for the life of me, even though in college I was like the big man on campus and the fact that I dated this tall, blonde, blue-eyed girl. But the thing is, like, she chose me, and it was completely by accident, absolutely by accident, um, and it's completely unconscious what I did. But later on, sort of dissecting my interaction with her, I had unconsciously used some of these psychological uh, techniques of like social proof and um, you know all these other all these other techniques. But when I moved to California, I didn't know anything. I couldn't get a date for the life of me, so I started studying pickup. And later on, I created the Asian Playboy blog because I was like, okay. You know, what am I, like, what, what I stand for? I'm like, I'm Asian, that's important to me, and I'm trying to live this sort of Playboy lifestyle. So I created this blog, and it just kind of took off because to a lot of people, that was like an oxymoron that just really stood out because there's no such thing as, like, an Asian Playboy. It just did not exist. It flew in the face of so many stereotypes. And it just started gaining this this really massive following until one day this Chinese Canadian mother called me to help out her son who had been harassed by neo-Nazis and I said you know uh, for three days and three nights I'm going to be the big brother he never had mm. and that's how I came up with the ABCs of attraction because I was thinking okay this kid's like 18 and you know he's never been out he doesn't really have a lot of friends so I need to make something very simple but also well-rounded enough for him to grow into so, for him to understand in the beginning, but there needs to be room for him to grow into because he's like 18. It's yeah. like buying like a kid, you know, at the age of eight, um, and expecting him to wear that shoe for the rest of his life. That's mm. that's that's not the way it works. So I came with the ABCs, and it was like, you know, if you know your alphabet, that's attitude, attract, approach. And so I try to take it from a holistic point of view, and. Um, use what I learned but also the things that didn't work for me didn't work for other people or work for other people and that's how I put it into the system because it's just not me cloning myself on another man mm -hmm. uh, I give them what I've learned but also like what work, doesn't work for other people and what works for other people You mentioned a your first student was harassed by neo Nazis, right? And I saw an article, and I believe it was on your Facebook page, or I might have seen it somewhere else as well, that um, Asian Americans suffer from higher levels of bullying and depression levels. So why would that be, particularly in the Asian American community? Well, there are a lot of factors at, at play. Um, one of it being we kind of considered easy pickings, like easy targets for it. And the reason why, again, many fold, whether it's like the body language or the fact that we can be very clannish or we're sort of, because we're the offspring of immigrants, we kind of have this mentality of like being quiet and not kind of shaking the boat, so to speak. Um, and so what that leads people to believe is that uh, we're, we're easy guys, you know, to, to, to choose to pick on um, and I certainly suffered a lot of 
you know, bullying when I was growing up. I think there was a study where they followed like a um, hundred Filipinos in a year, and they discovered like ninety nine percent of them had were exposed to like racism and bullying. Right. Uh, so it's yeah, so it's pretty prevalent. I mean, not every Asian American is going to experience it, but it is uh, pretty prevalent. Okay, yeah, I think this is something that's hard for a lot of people to understand who aren't exposed to racism directly. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you can see this, like, well, maybe on conservative channels or, or whatnot coming out of the States and they kind of deny the whole thing exists. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. you know, if you're a black person or another person of color, obviously, in this case, uh, Asian, you know, you do experience these things directly. Um, like, even for myself over here in Canada, like, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm, you know, pretty much a white guy. But I'm, but I'm mixed, I'm half Mexican, but most people think I'm my part Asian. I've heard different racist things from people directed at Asians towards me or towards <laughs> Latin people. It's kind of funny, I get, I get, you get this flack for, for everybody. Um, even when I was 14 with, ki with other kids, it was crazy. I was playing hockey, I was 14 years old, and this kid body checks me into the boards and he calls me a chink and skates off. And I had no response to this because I, I never heard this before and I'm not yeah. Asian, plus it was so wrong. So it was like, you know, it was wrong on so many levels. I just didn't have no response to it. I was like, well, uh, and he just skates away and it just like blew my mind, right? The first time I was exposed to racism when I was, when I was young mm -hmm. and not even at the right race. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I've, I've heard it. I've heard it's like, if you're going to be racist, at least, get, at least say the right racial epithet. Right? Yeah, exactly. But, you know, be accurate, please. Um, but, you know, it made him look really stupid in any case. But I guess he didn't know that because I couldn't say anything to him. Um, and I've, I've seen this as well, even in dry, but you know, more often than not, at least here, over here in Vancouver, like I've seen, it seems to come from hobos. Sometimes they'll start just yelling yeah. weird, random racist stuff um, when they're angry at the pharmacist or whatever. Um, and you've experienced it yourself. Like, is this something that is, that is really common or is it just kind of pops up here and there or kind of um, more on like, more on like a, a subtle level, not being really, like really super direct all the time? Well, there are different levels of racism, and, and part of that is dependent upon where you are. Like, like I said, I grew up in the South, in Texas, where you can imagine that is a lot more prevalent, especially growing up when you know kids are just dirty little rotten bastards that you know they have no no filter. Um, I certainly encounter that quite a bit, and you know uh, when you're in the workforce, those sort of racist acts. Are a lot more subtle. I mean, there's something that we call like the bamboo ceiling, where your advancement is sort of, you know, held back um, because of, of who and what you are, and it's not anything that's apparent or in your face. I think uh, one good example, actually, I'll use this. I once had a client. He was like the vice president of some Fortune 500 company, and he had moved from some Asian country when he was a kid. But he was like growing up and he didn't really feel racism when he was in corporate life and making that kind of like vice president, right? No one held him down, right? But what he said was that struck me was that even though no one held me down, no one helped me up, right? No one gave me a helping hand. And I look around to all my other peers who are like vice president. It's like they might have taken a shorter route or they had a mentor who helped them get up, you know, to that strata, you know, that stratosphere a lot quicker and as you know in, in coaching whenever you have a mentor you're almost always going to progress a lot faster mm. so he you know he had to do it on his own and he made it like no one held him down actively held him down but he had to take himself by by the bootstraps in order to be successful okay okay so it's, it's so most of the time it's kind of more of like on a subtle level it's not usually like really direct in your face yeah like I said it all depends on the environment that you're in like if you're gonna like, I once went to like this birthday party at a bar with some of my like, homegirls. They're all like white, like me and like six girls, and it was this little bar outside of Fort Worth. It wasn't even in like a proper city, and we're having a good time. And but it's kind of like this kind of redneck, you know, biker bar. And I'm like off to get a beer away from my friends, and this this guy comes up to me, grabs me by the shoulder, and says. We don't like your kind here, <laughs> wow. and like I need to leave before they are gonna jump my ass. So I had to leave the girls there because I was gonna get beat up by my, these rednecks. I mean that happens. Um, but if you go to like Los Angeles or New York, obviously that's gonna be less prevalent. But there's subtlety to it, right? I remember one time in Toronto, 
I had told all my students, we we're going to go into this club, um, meet us inside, but never go in more than like two guys at a time. I mean, that's just basic rules, right? But these are guys that are not used to going out. And so my students, they, they went out to eat, and then they, they all arrived, and there's like six of them. And obviously, the bouncer is going to deny them, right? Mm. He's going to deny it because there's like six dudes. Like, okay, yeah. we got to work our magic to get them in. But the student hears as he's walking away, like uh, the bouncer going over the radio is like, you know, there's a bunch of Asians trying to get in. We got too many Asians. Don't let any more Asians into the place. Wow. Right. So yeah, it, you know, you get you get things that are really in your face, and you get things that are like really subtle. I didn't know that. I didn't know there'd be an Asian limit on a on a club. This is something very new to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, part of it is they they kind of did it on themselves by showing up as a group of guys, right? I mean, that was the real instigation for that. And then the Asian thing was kind of like a reason. Um, I mean, I, there is a social and sexual hierarchy. Let's be honest, especially when it comes to the nightlife. You know, you got the, the celebrity at the top, and then you got the hot girls and, like, the hot guys and, you know, so on and so forth. And when it comes to guys, like Asians are pretty much um, not in all areas of the country, but you know, for a lot of areas, kind of like the the most least sexually desirable. Mm. Yeah, I've kind of I've seen that a lot. Um, for for you know, being targeted Asian men, like even I saw actually there was a funny video um, talking about like kind of like not not racist not racist racism like. These two work, white girls were talking. It's like I've never dated an Asian, and the Asian guy standing right beside her with this, like, you know, his mouth wide open. Like, <laughs> oh, what do you mean? Um, like, so obviously, like, you know, this, this seems like um, obviously it's a major focus for you. Like, I know you talk a lot on your Facebook page about the, the Asian community and the the kind of things that you help help Asian men deal with, like stuff that's specific to Asian men that like maybe a white guy wouldn't have to deal with. What what would be really the difference here? You already mentioned the a sexual hierarchy. What would be the, the big difference here though for an Asian man in the US trying to, you know, meet hot women as opposed to a white guy? Well you have to understand and I think this is one of the the benefits whenever someone takes like coaching for me and not really saying that to blow my own horn, but there are different types of Asians. When we say Asians, and you know, especially Asian Americans, mm. we're not like this monolithic block, yeah. right? When you say like a Mexican, like that has probably a bit more meaning to it, but like when you say Asian, we have like Asian immigrants, we have like Asian Chinese, Asian Vietnamese, yeah. and like a lot of these Asians don't like each other, <laughs> right? Mm. Um, and very different and cultures as well. Yeah, cultures. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'll have students that are like Asian American. They're tall. They're good looking. They, you know, they they have good hair, good fashion. And then I'll have like Asians that are straight from like China, like completely fresh off the boat. Mm -hmm. But here's the interesting thing: uh, in a lot of ways, the Fabi Asian guy, the Fabi immigrant, is a lot easier to teach and is a lot more successful with girls than the tall good-looking Asian-American and I was like I saw this pattern I was like why is that right and it's because because I'm you know I was born here I, I, I get it I got called gook and, and chink and slant eye when I was growing up so there's a part of me we call this internalized racism there's a part of me that's always like thought of myself as a second-class citizen and I'm not deserving because I'm not deserving I'm not gonna try and it took me a long time to defeat that and so you have these tall, good-looking Asian American guys that they, you know, they'll have girls hit on them, but they don't believe it. I've seen this. I'm like, dude, she's like throwing herself on you. And he's like, no, she wasn't. It was like, it's apparent, it's obvious. Well, an Asian immigrant, he's he doesn't even know what a gook or a chink is. He's never been called that in his life. Like growing up, he was the apex male. Right, no other guys, white guys, black guys were not above him. He was like at the top, or at the very least, equal to every other guy. Mm -hmm. And he moves here. His problem is not about race. His problem is like the lack of like language understanding, cultural understanding. And so there's that fear, like, oh, she's different, but not like I'm inferior. Although I still get that. So um, for him, all I have to do is like teach the skill set, the techniques, and. Um, going back to one of your original points, one of the things I'll do is like, for you, like, don't bother with any kind of indirect verbal game. It's completely useless. Like, completely useless. 
NLP, speed seduction. Like, I'll have these conversations with guys, and they're, like, Chinese, and they've been in America for six years, and they've been studying, like, all this pickup stuff for, like, six years. I'm like, throw that all out the window. It's completely fucking useless for you. Yeah. You studied the wrong thing. And it is. It's completely worthless to them. It's, it's, for most Asians, all that kind of more verbal-oriented material is completely worthless. Mm. Um, and they have to do more body language game, more direct style game, just more, you know, sexual sexualized game. Um, not that they shouldn't learn indirect, they should, um, just so that can, they can master the different skill sets that indirect offers, but, you know, when you don't speak the language, or if it's like your second language, mm -hmm. um, as I always say, confidence is a universal language. Everybody understands it. No matter the continent you're on, whether it's your Asia, Europe, Australia, everybody understands body language. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the primary differences. Like if you're Asian, you're watching this, you know, throw out all that verbal stuff that you learn. That's probably like the second to last thing that you need to learn. Like, like you mean again, Asians from uh, from actual like Asian countries, not uh, born in the US. All or Asians, or actually, I would say all Asians. Oh, okay. Uh, because when you do direct game and when you do body language, you concentrate in body language and you concentrate in sexuality. It's it it helps both types of Asians. Right for the Asian American with a lot of limiting beliefs, what's going to happen when he goes up to a white girl and says, "I think you're beautiful"? It destroys limiting beliefs right there when she responds, "Oh my God!" and like hugs them and kisses them. Right, right there, it destroys limiting beliefs. Yes. Um, and if you're a fobby Asian who can barely speak English, can you imagine them trying to do some sort of opinion opener? It would be so. I remember having Matador cornering me in like this club. He had like two head two Japanese students is like shaking me like, why the fuck can't they say these openers? I'm like, just give them direct openers because they can barely, they're, they're, the accent was so bad. Yeah. But I've had this, I, I tell my Bobby students, just go up there and tell her she's beautiful and they'll do this and it works and they'll go like, you can go up to her go like, you are fucking beautiful and it works, right? It's short, it's simple, it's really hard to mess up and because they're saying in such a sincere manner, it it actually forms like a, a synergy with their accent and people I mean it, it's charming to a lot of people right um, so it you know in that way it, it's something that that works for for both types of Asians okay yeah because I, I know over here uh, where I'm at there's there's actually some uh, Asian guys who do very well with women like they, they don't seem to have these limiting beliefs as well uh, being a second-class citizen I don't know if, I don't know if it's just like, like a difference between uh, Canadian and American uh, cultures, like maybe there is some um, validity to that. But most of the guys that I've met, um, who are not like the stereotypical Asian guy, like do really well, and they just kind of blow through any kind of uh, obstacles. They they don't have a block in their mind where they can't go talk right. to somebody who's attractive, right? Even one of my former coaches uh, was a, a Canadian Asian guy who grew up actually in a very conservative family, I believe, like kind of a traditional Asian family. But he, you know, he overcame all of that stuff and became really good with everything. So, yeah. so for so advice for for Asian American men or even who came from another country, like so, what would be the best? Is you like you're already advocating here, at least being really direct at body language. Like, what would be an example for you of um, like you, you mentioned the the physical aspect, the sexual being upping the physical. Um, um, lost the word. The physical, yeah, the physical game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. Universal advice I would give that everybody could do, whether you're Asian or not, but it definitely afflicts Asians a lot more, is what I call like the Asian poker face, right? And this is something that I stress with my students because communication is happening on multiple levels, and it is not just my words. It's like, how am I saying it? Whether it's my tonality, my facial expressions, my energy, my body language. And the first thing a girl sees is your face. Yeah. Now, they've done studies, like, you know, the witness studies when it comes to, like, selecting juries and, and all that kind of stuff, where they discovered that people of different ethnic backgrounds have a harder time telling what your, what your race is and what your emotional state is. And it's not because of racism or anything like that. It's just because they haven't been around, like, a lot of black people. They haven't been around a lot of white people. They haven't been around a lot of Asians. And I would get this all the time with my college girlfriend. I would go to these parties with her, and I'd be so proud because I was like the only guy. Like it was engineering, so I was like, 
there were like ten guys to every one girl, and I had a, like a, a hot uh, girlfriend, and I was also the only Asian guy with a white girlfriend, right? So I'd be there, and I'd be like really proud, like, "Hey, I got a girlfriend," and then she'd be like, "Are you angry at me? Why are you upset at me? What did I do?" And then he's like, "What are you talking about, babe? I'm cool." But then he's like, "I didn't realize it at the time, but the way I came off is like I didn't express myself, right?" And so. I was being chill, but my chill face looked like this. You know, it's what I call like the Asian poker face. So, um, this is one of the things why I say like guys who are learning too much verbal game, you're not learning how to control the rest of your message, right? There are like so many channels that she's reading, and if you go up to a girl and you're trying to do whatever opinion opener, and you go like, "Hey, who do you think lies more?" Right, and you just look like some creepy guy. She's gonna avoid you, despite however good your opener is. And you know, if I can get a student, and he goes up to a girl and he smiles, is like, "Hi, my name is JT." It'll work, yeah. right? Even if it's just the most simple, uh, you know, most oldest opener in the book, which is like, "Hi, my name is JT." It'll work because of everything else that he's doing correctly. And again, um, and by watching this, just realize it's not your words that matter. It's it's how like beginners think what, average think how, experts think where. Okay, that's a really good description, and, and it's funny you mentioned the the Asian poker face. Cause I actually had a, a Asian student recently from China, and he rarely smiles, and uh, mm -hmm. you know even when I'm talking with him, it's hard to get like any kind of emotions coming out about him. Yeah. So and he's you know he has a trouble connecting with a lot of women that way, or at least they're not connecting with him because you know there's this wall there and they're not they probably just can't read him like they're not sure what's you know does he want to kill exactly. them or <laughs> exactly to him and, and to Asian culture that's sort of normal uh, but it it does it is one of the most common initial stumbling blocks that if they simply smile that would that would probably increase their open rate by like double at least because if they're getting you know, really astronomically low open rates, it is probably because of that. They're not getting even like the same kind of low open rates of a of an average you know white guy um, who doesn't even know game, right? So if they could do that, then they would probably reach you know parity with every other below average guy that's just learning game. But now they they're like here, mm -hmm. right? And they're not even here. As opposed to even like being average, so if they can get that, you know, just so they, they can reach parity. Okay, and let's let's tackle maybe a one or two uh, Asian stereotypes too, um, since we're basically on the Asian theme here uh, for this show. For in your experience, like, and I've seen this before too, with, with uh, or I've seen at least Asian uh, men making comments about this online. They feel any. Actually, you've already touched on this uh, a little bit too, but the mindset growing up, this uh, feeling like a, a second-class citizen. But a lot of these guys feel like, you know, whether they're, they're I guess actually they're usually born here or in the States, uh, they feel like, oh, a white woman's not going to like me. Like, white women don't like Asian men, right? Uh, is there any right. val validity to the, the... Is that statement, like, valid at all? Or is that just total bullshit? <laughs> well, you have to look at a, a, at a couple of different point of views. Um, from an objective point of view, sure. I mean, especially here in America, where you know racism exists, uh, it's very, it, it's there. There are multiple studies. I could quote you so many studies of from online dating where Asian men are, are like the lowest of any kind of ethnic group that gets a response rate. Um, but when you think of it from the student point of view, from like the man on the street. It serves no purpose to really dwell on that because it's not going to help you, right? And I used to be that way. I used to be that college kid um, that looked around and I saw like white guys dating Asian girls and Asian girls telling people that they would never date an Asian guy. That would make me so angry in college. Um, but all that does is undermine your own confidence. It's like a virus. It's a poison that's like just killing you. Uh, and so concentrating on that and, and, and trying to you know, go online and rant about that. It serves no purpose because ultimately the only way to defeat those stereotypes, to make other women attracted to you, is to show uh, people of different races connecting and intimately connecting. Like you have to be that change. You have to show that, that other people, that other, you know, two other women that Asian men are attractive. And here's the thing though. Um, online, it's very easy for people to 
unconsciously act upon their racism. It's like, oh, I'm never going to date a guy under five foot six, so mm. blah, blah. But in real life, it's so much easier for me to overpower any kind of stereotype by going up to her, by being, you know, whatever. Like I always say, I would love to be tall, dark, and handsome, but I can settle for being short, stunning, and smooth. And so, yeah, is there absolutely truth to that? Sure, but, you know, it doesn't help the individual. But also, it's we as men, as Asian men, we need to take ownership of that stereotype too because we're doing it to ourselves. Hmm. Um, I remember, you know, I have these conversations with girls. Actually, I'll give you another story. One of my wing girls used to, you know, um, uh, she is the Playboy Playmate of the Year 2010, Claire Sinclair. She used to work for me before she became all like famous and everything like that. And she lived on Alhambra, which is like 80% Asian. Mm -hmm. And she would say, like, every day, guys would hit on her. You know, just every single day. There's like white guys, black guys, you know, Hispanic guys. And remember, she's living in an Asian dominated neighborhood. And the 18 years that she lived there around Asians, you know how many Asians hit on her in school and just walking around? None. Like, none. So, the reason a lot of times um, women, you know, Asians think that, you know, Asian guys don't think that white girls will never date them. Is because the number one stereotype that women have, white women have of Asian men, is Asian men only date Asian women. Mm. So they're like, well, he's cute, but he would never date me, so I'm not going to do anything. And so, like, the Asian guy is like, well, she's not looking at me, and so she would never date an Asian guy. So it becomes this, like, this vortex of misunderstanding. And again, it's, it's our responsibility as men to go up there, not to really seek that signal, because then you're just playing it safe, and you've got to make that first step, mm -hmm. right, and convince her that you're, um, you know, a viable dating partner. And like I said, like 90% of the girls I ever dated have never dated an Asian guy. So I am their first, and, and that's just the way it is, and you just have to accept that. Uh, but to anyone watching this, you know, realize that it's not that hard, like, a lot of women in real life don't really have that initial barrier against. They don't have four. Like, it's kind of mm. like the, the Fortune 500 vice president I was talking about. Like, there's no girl, or there's a rare girl, but like the majority of girls, they're not going to help an Asian guy out, right? But they won't necessarily actively say no to you just because you're Asian. Mm. It all happened every once in a blue moon. happens to me. Um, but most of them will be receptive if you approach them correctly. Okay, it's kind of almost giving them an opportunity to to like them or not, right? It's it's just like almost like any other approach. Like you don't know if the woman's gonna like you or not if you don't even present yourself and give her the option, right? Exactly. So it seems like a lot of guys exactly. in the Asian American community they're just not even presenting themselves as an option to somebody. That's kind of like, oh, she's not gonna like me, so they don't even try at all. Like, what, what's it? Are you frozen? Are you frozen? Oh, there you are. Had a little freeze. Unfrozen? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I can tell you. I can see you fine. Like, I could see you, but you can see me. Like, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I, I saw you just a, a frozen picture there. So okay. now you're coming in. You're kind of a little bit blurry, but you're coming back. All right. The recording's still going. All right. Okay. Um, what were we talking about? <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah, Asian men putting uh, themselves... As an oh, I was gonna, I was about to make a, a comment real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Kind of going. Right. Um, so speaking of which, I mean, it, it goes back to what I was saying: how Asian Americans, like who are born here, have higher limiting beliefs. So you know, I if I take a, a immigrant Asian, he'll do better because he doesn't think he doesn't go online and, and think all those things that you were just talking about, like oh, white girls don't like us. He just doesn't have the skill set. Mm -hmm. Well, like the Asian Americans are like, oh, white girls don't like us, you know, and he believes it, so he doesn't do anything. As Wayne Gretzky said, um, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. So, yeah, these guys, these Asian guys, they're not taking shots. Yeah, of course, white girls don't like him because he's not taking a shot. And, but if I send my immigrant, like, fobby Asian student over there with his fobby Asian hair and his fobby Asian clothes, his fobby Asian teeth and his fobby Asian accent, he can get her. 
right? And I'll see this sometimes, like these Asian guys will be at a club and they're like, what the fuck's going on? How do these 10 Asian guys have all these white girls and we got nothing, right? So, like, you got to take that shot, you know? It's like, you got to get over those limiting beliefs. Okay. Do you find uh, for the students that go to you, well, obviously the students are going to you, it's because they're not approaching women in the first place or they want to be better. Is it... Is this like because guys in general, at least around here in, in most areas uh, in North America, guys in general aren't very good at approaching because they don't approach, right? And typically, mm-hmm. that's, that's a big complaint over here in Vancouver. Women always say, "Yeah, guys don't approach here," and when they do, it's usually uh, some creepy guy who's doing it improperly, <laughs> right? Um, is it is that more prevalent with Asian men, or is that kind of like just even across the board, just men in general just don't have the balls to go and talk to a woman? Well, you have to realize. Again, it kind of depends on which type of Asian that you're talking about. I know, like, the immigrant Asians here, um, because, you know, we're immigrants, we're sort of taught um, to study and to work really hard and go to college and get the job. And then, you know, finally when you're, like, 26 and you're established, then you're supposed to, like, auto-magically have a wife. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's kind of, like, the, the joke amongst Asian Americans. Like, mom is, like, no play dates, you know, no play dates or growing up, no play dates, study. And then, like, she wonders why at the age of 24 she doesn't have, she's not a grand, grandmother, right? Mm-hmm. Like, somewhere along the line, you know, you got to socialize, but we're taught not to. We're discouraged from it in a lot of ways. Um, but then if you talk about like more of the, the Asian Asian, you have to realize that you know you have a lot of countries that are transitioning from third world countries to first world. And so you, you're going from a dating culture that is more old school, obviously, where maybe you know arranged marriages or you know very still very common is sort of like the, the, like the male order bride uh, where you know they'll, they'll just set someone up with some village wife. Right, because he, you know, he he's working hard and he's not going out there and actively dating. So, in a lot of ways, um, a lot of kind of dating technology, so to speak, is very stuck um, in the past, and it's slowly changing. And it has to change when you consider that there are 24 million missing Chinese women, and that's just in China because of female infanticide. Um, but then you have Korea and Japan, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so the dating has to change, but it's, it's doing it very slowly. Okay, okay, I can see that. Um, you reminded me of some, something I saw on Vice, actually, and I can't remember which country it was. Um, over is it Kajikistan, I'm not saying that properly either, but anyways, somewhere close to Russia, or, or like somewhere close to Mongolia, and the people, um, I guess like they wouldn't be considered Asian necessarily, maybe like it's kind of like a, a mix, maybe from the, you know, the, for the past heritage with the, the Mongolian invasions, uh, but people, p- people look Asian, anyways and I remember that this is a totally fucked up story where like they they kidnap wives like if you want to get married <laughs> to somebody you kidnap her and you're and and you bring her to your family who tries to convince her to marry the guy like, <laughs> like this is a thing like if officially it's illegal but the police are not enforcing the law and they'll mm. and they literally like in, in the vice special they actually showed pe- women being kidnapped for uh, weddings like it's crazy. Wow. It blows my mind. I can't like even believe that exists. But these guys would like they would actually pick them up, literally pick them up, and run into a car, like a, a full-on kidnapping. And people on the street won't do anything. And this is this like you know this is like a traditional marriage. Like, have Have you heard about this one, or have you seen that vice story? No, no, I'm not necessarily familiar with that. But I I do know that uh, that there is like a pretty large like mail order bride service, like you know Filipinos, um, you know just shipping them off to like Vietnam or just wherever there is a very sparse population. Mm. I know was it like Russia was considering legislation to make it illegal to marry Chinese guys because they would be crossing to get themselves like Russian brides, right? Wow. Funny you mentioned Russians too. You were talking about the, the Asian um, poker face. I see mm-hmm. that actually with a lot of Russian guys as well. I've had Russian students and they also very like <laughs> you don't know yeah, that stoic expression very stoic very stern you don't know if they're they want to kill you or what's happening right it's kind of right, right. kind of funny um and with the male also the, the male or brides um actually let's talk about white guys and asian girls <laughs> all right right so this is a this is you know this is obviously a thing we see that we see these kind of couples a lot and you know you're sure, on the opposite sure. side there you're trying to you're trying to change it around making asian men with with white girls, you know, the, what do you call it? The uh, AM Asian man? WF. AM, right, FEMA, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. okay. 
why why is it more why is it such a, why is this a thing why is it a prevalent thing that you know white guys are always paired with oh you're frozen oh wait, no you're not frozen okay yeah cut that out why is it a thing that asian women and white guys always seem to be you know it's a, it's a common thing for couples to occur this way well again there are a lot of a lot of reasons uh, from hollywood and, and the stereotypes and you know if you want to look at historical reasons like colonialism you know, China being colonized by Britain and, and Vietnam by France and, and so on and so forth where you kind of have this established hierarchy where like white is at top and that's kind of like uh, carried over. Um, so you'll get a lot of Asian girls that have these internalized belief systems like when they marry they want to like they want to marry up or uh, I'll see this quite a bit um, they'll they'll sleep with white guys and black guys but they only want to marry Asians. So, you know, they're going to sleep around, you know, go on the cop carousel, and then they'll settle down, right? But they won't want to date Asian guys. They're just going to marry, right? But they're going to give a pussy to everybody else. <laughs> um, and it is because of just you know a lot of a lot of the the globalization of certain beauty standards where um, where white is, is considered more beautiful, and and so you have these let's say white guys too. Where who who are becoming very frustrated with modern day feminism and the fact that they have to treat women as equals, which is like terrible, right? Um, and so they're like, okay, these Asian women who are probably like, you know, they're they're thinking like, uh, what is it, uh, apocalypse now? And uh, you know, the Vietnamese hookers who go like, oh, two dollar make you holla, like they're <laughs> looking for that, like you know, they don't care if she can barely speak English. They want someone that's completely subservient that will service their, their yellow fetish, mm. right? Someone that is third world will treat him like a god because he's like, you know, this big man. But in reality, he's just like some nerdy, awkward white guy who couldn't, you know, be successful with a white girl. You see this all the time with like the nerdy guys. Um, and you see this a lot in the PUA community. Uh, some white instructor, he's like, oh, I sleep with 100 women. Like, they're all like Asian folly ones. He you know, like marries and like, you know it happens quite a bit. It's just like they got their skills by practicing on like, these third world country like Asian women and sure whatever. Um, so you see that quite a bit uh, and there's a lot of forces at play that create that. Now I know on the the reverse hand people might say it was isn't that kind of what I do? But to me is I try to humanize both like white girls and black girls to Asian men because there's you know, the perspective is, like, Asian guys think white women are up here, all right? Or they'll get, like, so angry, like, oh, white bitches, I'm going to kill the white man, all that kind of stuff. So it's like, so I want to humanize where we're equal. And I want to show, like, white women and black women that Asian guys are cool, we're masculine, where you're equal. And I want to show, like, Asian men that these white girls and stuff, they're not above you and they're not below you. You know, they're you're equal and that you can be an equal opportunity dater. Um, so it's something that's... Obviously, kind of a, a, a you know a, a pain point in our communicate community because you see it all the time. It is what is it? Uh, I think statistically, Asian women are three times more likely to outmarry to a white guy than any other race. So and, you know, it's very popular. I mean, that's a big number. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it is what it is. I mean, it's kind of changed over time, um, just a little bit, but it, it not to any really big global trend right because you still have people that are just shipping in like Asian wives and stuff like that so okay um, but will you see any difference though with obviously well, obviously with women who are raised though in the, in the United States raised in Canada because uh, I, I kind of see like I'm I'm dating uh, my girlfriend is is Asian Canadian right and I see no difference with her at all between for between her and a white girl like culturally like the way you know behaviors and this kind of stuff and um, but I do see obviously you know other than the way she looks, but I do see a big difference from women who do come from Asian countries, right? And their confidence levels, right. the way they behave. Like my girlfriend is not submissive at all in like regular life, right? Right. So I can't be like, oh, you know, my little my little Asian girlfriend, you 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 <laughs> my little geisha, <laughs> <laughs> my little geisha. There's there's none of that crap, right? She won't. She's not gonna put right. up any bullshit, right? Um, it's, it's basically just dating you know somebody who looks uh, Asian, um, although her family is from. From from an actual Asian country, um, I had a point, but I, I don't have my point anymore. <laughs> what, like, what is what is the difference between like the Asian women? 
Um, yeah, let's go with that because I, I lost it. Sure, sure. Like you're saying, like Asian Americans, those who are born here, you might find like for sure, uh, typically more more confident or more social at least. Um, and then you know, for those like more immigrant Asian women, you'll definitely find that they're more clannish, more cliquish. Like in order to perk them, you kind of have to like go more like befriend the guys, befriend the friends, and get introduced to it because they're going to be very sort of like resistant to, to outside influence unless they've been introduced. Um, in my experience, if they're if, if she's you know she's Asian and she's with like white girls, treat her like another white girl. There's like almost no really discernible difference. Yeah. You know, but if it's like a bunch of Asian girls, just be prepared for that Asian click. <laughs> you know, that Asian click that is just like, oh no, you know. So be prepared for that, and that's that's when you do more classic indirect, and yeah, you know, like the direct style wouldn't work as, as effectively on when when they're a click. Okay. How if you're teaching like because I know you get white students too, and you get you're focusing most. When you're teaching one, and as opposed, to well, I would say one of the big differences is just the result that they get is just a lot more instant, uh, you know, and, and bigger than quite frankly my Asian students, and that's because a lot of my Asian students are coming in where they have no baseline to to speak of. They're literally coming in like having not socialized, never been on dates, and things of that nature. Uh, so I have this white guy who is socially normal, uh, maybe a little bit below, and I don't have to build him up from nothing, right? I give him these techniques, and all of a sudden he's like, you know, I want you to get a threesome th that weekend, and then like the weekend after you get like a foursome. It's like nuts. Um, it's like giving like somebody like the codes to like the nuclear football, um, and it's because they can just concentrate on the technique. They don't have to concentrate on like the limiting beliefs. They can do all like the sexual compliance, the BLP, all the stuff to like to really rapidly escalate and, and get the girl, and they don't have to do and work with the more abstract because they don't think they don't think themselves out of success. They don't get in their own way, right? They just didn't know what to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the white guys, black guys. I mean, it's interesting. I've had boot camps where I didn't have a single like Asian student. It's like white guys and black guys. I was like, okay, <laughs> cool, whatever. Um, and it's because they can just they just game and they just game. It's like pure gaming. I don't have to like like hold their hand as they like mentally break down and cry, right? Like I'll have that. I have to. I guess part of the, one of the differences, at least for me as a coach, is I can when it comes to white guys, black guys, I can literally just coach, right? But when it comes to Asians, I have to also be a therapist. You know, yeah. I said like these boot camps for me is like I, I wish I could have like you know all these other students because it's it seems so easy, right? Um, I, dealing with I mean I love it because it's it's more than just a job for me, but it is completely emotionally exhausting. Like I, we call it Mondays Black Mondays because we are completely wiped. Because you spend the entire weekend just making sure that, you know, he doesn't crack, right, um, to, to understand him. Because a lot of these guys have just complete horror stories about their growing up, growing up just completely repressed, right, and emotionally stunted and resentment against white people, resentment against his family, resentment against women, resentment against, like, white women, resentment against Asian women. Um, so half the battle is, you know, I can, I can teach anybody techniques, Regardless, but it is that um, you know, making, giving them what they need to emotionally heal themselves. No. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I his his Facebook, he seemed like a, a tall, good-looking, kind of like this K-pop 
you know, he worked a lot on his 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 look, um, and it you get that you get that kind of level of jealousy. Is like, how is it this short guy is being successful when I'm not? And obviously, the answer is just I put in that work. Like when I was an engineer, I was holding down a nine to five job, but also going out four to six nights and facing my fears. And sometimes nights were so bad I would go home and I would cry, but then. Next day, I went out again, and here's this guy. He's doing like the lowest risk thing he can do, which is like work on his appearance. And you should, I think it, it helps a lot. But he was spending a lot of money making himself look good, but not actually putting his balls on the line. And so, it, you know, it just builds up to this resentment where he wanted to learn from me, but he was like just so angry that I was getting results. Um, and he wasn't, and that's because he wasn't willing to go through the pain. He wasn't really to going go through that, you know, that fire where where you you are getting rejected and you know you are getting embarrassed and humiliated. Um, and he here he was he was just letting it fester his bitter you know his bitterness just fester on the inside while he just stayed home and combed his hair and looked in the mirror and just you know just let that fester like a poison. He, I guess he found it the hard way that it didn't work. His, you know, brushing his hair nicely just wasn't quite enough. Yeah, you got to put yourself out there, and you got to, yeah, you, you have to be willing to get your your balls kicked in a couple of times. Yeah, that that work ethic is, is huge. Like you said, you go to five or six nights or whatever every week, even though you're working full time mm -hmm. job. And, yep. Uh, even yep. For, for myself, when I started, when I tried to learn how to go uh, walk up to a woman in the street and introduce myself, that was a huge challenge. And there was that work ethic. Like I was obsessed with the idea. Like I have to learn this. And I would go out day after day and, and literally do nothing. I'd walk around in circles around the whole city. And there's a lot of walking. Um, and that was extremely frustrating. But I couldn't give up because I had this idea in my head. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn this. I'm going to get good at it. And I just kept going until I finally actually did a real approach, which is like... Um, a major uh, game changer, I guess, for my whole life, actually. Um, right, right. right. Uh, did you, did you, uh, did you actually end up getting any reason? Like, do you were you able to get any reason across to him, or was he, he just stayed p like purely bitter and jaded, and he just? No, I, I think he blocked me. He blocked you. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I was like, I think he unfriended me or something like that. He was just like, you know, seeing me with girls, and he, he was just like, fuck it, yeah. <laughs> like he didn't, he didn't want that image of an Asian guy with white girls that wasn't him, right? Which is kind of ironic because you kind of need to see that to, to, lo to slowly change that thought process. But again, this is what happened to some guys who, who let that, and they overthink it, and they let that kind of poison um, fester in their confidence where... You know, I can't. I can't help guys. I don't want to be helped. Okay. So. Well, I can kind of see like, oh, like even for somebody who's jealous of other people who have like, like some guy who has a nice car and the other guy works really hard and he doesn't have a nice car. What does that guy have a nice car? And it's just because the actions the other guy took, which were you know, di different enough. They both worked hard, but one guy was working hard on the right things. Um, but there's that there's that jealousy though that you know, they, why am I not also awesome like that person? Look at all the stuff I do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so in closing, uh, for the Asian American and Asian Canadian uh, communities out there, or just uh, men in general, what would be really the best way to start when you're starting right from the bottom, from scratch? Um, well, I always tell everybody that you want to be successful because it's your Asian, not in spite of it. And that you, I know some people go through this growth or this period where like, oh, if I act more white, I'll be more successful. It's not about acting white, it's about acting um, and understanding who you are, uh, and being proud of who you are, and not being ashamed of being Asian, because I'll you know I'll hear that a lot. And you have to work in unison of making sure that you have that right thought process, or at least you're working on. It. You're you're slowly disem you know disassembling like uh, really bad limiting beliefs. And the first step is recognizing it and, and writing down what kind of negative thoughts or any kind of internalized belief systems that you have. You know, I thought being short girls wouldn't like me. I thought being Asian girls wouldn't like me. And over time, I, I changed that. And part of that was through action. But, you know, the first step is recognizing it, maybe writing it down. And then, obviously, you need to take action because simply thinking about it is not going to change anything. You know, you need to be aware of the problem, and then you need to take action. So probably like the easiest thing like um, an Asian-American, Asian person in general can do 
is get out there and just say hello, you know, maybe to 10 people and make eye contact and especially smile, right? Say cookies, right? And it forms that natural smile and it will make approaching so much easier and you slowly expand your comfort zone, you know, like some guys just the idea of saying hello to anybody is terrifying because they don't do that because mm. they're all like culturally they, they stay within their bubble and they don't go outside their bubble and this is why we have all these kind of Asian cliques um, you know smiling making good eye contact facial expressions is really important really important um, and it can be as simple as hi like don't spend too much time trying to study verbal game like work more on physical game because the oldest pickup line, the most successful pickup line in the world is, hi, my name is JT. Yeah. That's, that's great. So it sounds like basically kind of a lot of focus on, love, on self-love and taking action, just doing something. Like even your, your basic advice about going out and saying hi to people, it, I, this is the same kind of advice I give to my students as well. And it's funny how difficult it is for a lot of guys to follow through with that, just for that, yeah. that very basic level going out and mm-hmm. like in the morning saying good morning or starting a conversation with uh, a store clerk like it's really really basic but it, so many people have resistance to this it's almost like because it's such a, a subtle thing too it's um getting used to being social in general it's almost like they feel maybe they're not going to get the instant results so why bother doing that at all why bother having conversations or saying hello to people even though it has yeah. like a big impact exactly it's because socializing hasn't been internalized yet I think what is it uh, they say that it takes 28 daily repetitions for a muscle memory link to, to be formed mm-hmm. and so you know you can't simply go out like on a one day to say hello and all of a sudden you're, you're used to that you have to do it over time it's like as Aristotle said excellence is not an action excellence is a habit it's a habit that you continually do every day until you know you get to the point where you're like you don't say hello to a pretty girl, and then you feel weird. It's like, why didn't I feel? I didn't say hello. Like you feel now, you feel awkward, and you've internalized it. Here, you know, a lot of guys they they haven't internalized the concept of just being social just to be social. Yeah. No, I like that you mentioned that too. You know, you you get to that point where where it's weird. Now it's weird not to say hello. Now it's weird mm-hmm. not to start a conversation. You're like, oh, I didn't I didn't say hi. This feels Damn. wrong. Right, that's, exactly. that's a great point to get to, right? Because now you're really like you're ahead of the pack. Like it's easier, so much easier to stretch yourself a little bit farther and go and approach somebody who's really attractive. If you're already like, if you feel weird if you don't say hello, like that's when you hit these kind of social, uh, these kind of um, these skill levels or these these habits. When you actually create a real habit, you ingrain it, internalize it. Uh, it's so powerful on a long-term basis. Like maybe it's not instant results if you say good morning to somebody, but when you're doing it all the time, this you know turns out major results. Yeah, exactly. Awesome, JT. Well, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Really enjoyed having you. If somebody wanted to get in touch with you for coaching or for any questions, uh, where should they go? Well, you know, first of all, thank you, Eddie, for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Um, if they want to reach me, they can just go to my website at www.abcsofattraction.com or ABCs of Attraction. We also have a toll-free number at one eight 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 six eight nine game or four two six three, or just e- email us at support at abcofattraction.com. Oh, well, you snagged a good number there with the one eight hundred game, basically. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. All right, and I'll, I will be including a link as well for anybody who's too lazy to uh, type those. Uh, those letters in they can just make a click and go straight to you awesome thanks a lot uh, again JT and thanks everyone for joining